They are tiny. Last year, the Chinese bought 13 million cars. We struggled to sell 12 million cars. They have a billion, 300 million people, and they're entering the industrial age. The next chart kind of looks at this. Sub I'd be happy to yield for a moment. For what purpose does the gentle lady rise? Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk a privileged report from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the title. Report to accompany House Resolution 276, resolution providing for further consideration of the bill, H.R. 1540, to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2012 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction to prescribe military personnel strengths for fiscal year 2012 and for other purposes. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Maryland for yielding. Thank you. Thank you very much. The, the next chart looks at, at this same uh, global picture in a somewhat different way. The left bar is the um, top 10 oil and gas companies on the basis of oil production. Now, we think ExxonMobil and Royal Dutch Shell and BP are pretty big players, don't we? They have only collectively 22% of all the oil production in the world. The right-hand bar looks at another part of this, and that is who has the oil. Notice that our big three or four don't even show up over there. Almost all, these are the top ten. Almost all of the top ten are Arab countries where it's not a company who owns the oil, it's a country that owns the oil. Luke Oil, which is kind of private up there, they show it white in, in Russia, is only 2% of the total amount of oil held by the top 10 countries in reserves. By the way, China is buying up reserves all over the world. And I asked the State Department, why would they do that? Since in today's world, it doesn't make any difference who owns the oil. The person who comes at the global oil auction with enough dollars, and let's hope it stays dollars and doesn't go to euros, or we're in really big trouble, you buy the oil you want. So we have only 2% of the oil. We use 25% of the oil. And we aren't buying oil reserves anywhere. What is the difference? The State Department's answer, and I don't think that's the correct answer, they told me that China didn't understand the marketplace. Come on now. A country that during this recession dropped from 14% growth to 8% growth, and they don't understand the marketplace. China's doing something else simultaneously, by the way. They're aggressively building a blue water navy. Do you think the time might come when China says, hey, you know, we've got a billion, 300 million people? And these 900 million people that are in rural areas through the miracle of communications know the value of an industrialized society. And they're saying, gee, how about us? And I think China sees their empire unraveling the way the Soviet empire unraveled if they can't meet the needs of these people. Might it be that China is buying all these oil reserves and building a big blue water navy because the day will come they're going to tell us, gee, I'm sorry but it's our oil. We have a billion, 300 million people, and we can't, we can't share the oil. I led a Codell to China a little over four years ago, and I was uh, stunned. This wasn't just the people concerned about energy in China. It was everybody we met. They talked about post-oil. There will, of course, be a post-oil world. It'll be a long while from now. Hyman Rickover had no idea how long this age of oil would last. He was 100 years into what he called this golden age. We now know pretty much how long the age of oil will last. We're about halfway through it. We're 150 years in it, and, and he was right. In the 8,000-year recorded history of man, Hyman Rickover said the age of oil would be but a blip. It'll be about 300 years long. We're 150 years in it. From now on, there'll be ever, the next 150 years, ever less and less 
harder and harder to get more and more expensive. This was their five-point plan. Conservation. My wife says that she thinks that conservatives ought to be interested in conservation. They don't seem to be because they come from a common root. And she wonders why conservatives aren't interested in conservation. That's the only thing we can do to buy some time, to free up some energy so that we can invest in developing alternatives. The second and third were domestic sources of energy and diversify as much as you can. And the fourth one may surprise you. Environmental impact. Be kind to the environment. They know they're not. But as I mentioned, they have these 900 million people that are clamoring for the benefits of an industrialized society, so they're building a coal-fired power plant every week. And they're starting the destruction of 100 nuclear power plants. And the fifth, the fifth bullet here, international cooperation. They know that there is no way that any one nation can face this problem alone, that we need international cooperation. But while they plead for international cooperation, they are planning for the eventuality that we won't have international cooperation because they are buying up oil reserves all over the world. Not just oil reserves, they're buying goodwill. What do you need? A soccer stadium? A hospital? Roads? Wherever they buy oil reserves, they're buying goodwill. And remember, they're simultaneously building this huge blue water navy. Well, what now? Our next chart and our last chart for this evening? What America needs. We're the most creative, innovative society in the world. If we understand the problem, there's nothing that we can't do. Our people just need to understand the problem. We need to have leadership that understands the problem. I tell audiences that uh, the innocence and ignorance on matters of energy in our general population is astounding. And sadly, we have truly representative government. Well, what do we do? We need the total commitment of World War II. I lived through that war. I was born in 1926. I know the total commitment we had during that war. There's been nothing like it since. We need the technology intensity and focus of the Apollo program to land a man on the moon. That cost $275 billion in 06 dollars, which is when oil peaked. And we need to have the urgency of the Manhattan Project. Minus that, we're going to face the kind of disruptions that was forecast by the Hirsch Commission, the big SAIC report. The world has never faced a problem like this. I like challenges. They excite me. And this is a huge challenge. It's an exhilarating challenge. But I know with proper information, with proper knowledge, with proper leadership, the United States is up to this. By the way, developing this green technology will again make us an exporting country. People brag about we have this nice, clean, service-based economy. If you think about that, no matter how much you charge for cutting each other's hair and taking in each other's laundry, that is not going to be a viable economy, isn't it? Only three things produce wealth, and manufacturing is a major one of those. That's now all moving offshore. We could again become a major manufacturing country by focusing on this green technology and developing the alternatives that we must develop. We're going to continue to maintain our quality of life. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to a very challenging future, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair would entertain a motion to adjourn. Sir? The chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I move you now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion is adopted. According to the House, standing uh, stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow for morning hour debate. Today, House and Senate members met to hear a speech by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Later, the House took up legislation on 